Welcome to Ten with Zen, a podcast with Zen Educate. Here we discuss all things education, leadership, schools, and more. You've probably chosen to listen today, as you're currently working with or interested to find out more about working with children in your school who are refugees. There are many teachers and educators across the country working with children who have arrived here in traumatic circumstances with struggles and a long journey behind them. And our role is to welcome them, provide the best education opportunities we can, and to bring compassion and hope. Our podcast today is to help us understand more about what refugee children in our school need. So my guest for this extended episode is Gulwali Pasali. Gulwali arrived in England in 2006 as an unaccompanied child refugee, escaping the war in Afghanistan. We talk about his experiences in school, his book, The Lightless Sky, his current work, and how teachers and educators can help children who are refugees. We originally interviewed Gulwali for our updated children's safeguarding training, and were so inspired by his story, we wanted to share it more widely. We hope you too are challenged and inspired by what you hear today. This is 10 with Zen a podcast hosted by Helen Woodward, leadership consultant and former head of school improvement at the Department for Education. Brought to you by Zen Educate, each episode features a prominent guest sharing insights and best practice based on their own unique experiences. This could be as a school leader, an SEN specialist, a parent and beyond. If you like the sound of 10 with Zen, make sure you follow and subscribe on Spotify, Apple or whatever platform you're listening on. Gulwali, thank you so much for joining us to, to do this recording today. Um, but first of all, let me let me welcome you. So thank, thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. A big big welcome from Zen Educate. Um, can you tell us briefly how it was that you came to be in England? So I came to the UK as an unaccompanied minor from Afghanistan at the age of thirteen. I made the journey across half of the world, about twelve thousand miles, uh, on my own. So when I got to the UK, finally after a year of being on this journey and the hands of smugglers and, and traffickers and being mistreated by authorities and so a lot of uh, inhumanity and, and cruelty along the way. When I go to the UK, my, uh, my experiences wasn't over. This was another battle, another struggle with the home office, with, the, with social services. Um, although they were uh, nicer compared to the rest of the world, the rest of the countries that I passed through, but still there was a system of disbelief. Uh, social services did not believe that I was 13 at the time. The Home Office did not expect it, accepted my nationality that I was an Afghan citizen. So, yeah, that's how I ended up being in the UK. came here as a refugee and um, it took me many years before I was able to convince uh, a local authority and, and the Home Office that I was the age of that I was and uh, my nationality was what I was saying it was. So I, just, I was seen as a suspect, as a criminal. And sadly, things has not improved for unaccompanied minors who, come to, who somehow makes it to the UK. And, uh, and that's why I do what I do in terms of advocating and campaigning for the rights of refugees, particularly unaccompanied minors, because, you know, they, they have it very tough. Yeah, I understand that. And, and actually the key word amongst everything, well, two key words, really. One is unaccompanied and that you were a, you were a child, you know, an unaccompanied minor. So having gone through that in- incredible journey and the trauma of being in the hands of smugglers and the, the separation, um, actually being unaccompanied when you arrived in England was, was really significant for you, I'm sure. Exactly. And I mean, even before that, you know, growing up in a war zone, that impacts you and that traumatizes you and mentally and emotionally. The least we should be doing is showing compassion and solidarity and empathy towards these people and then helping, supporting them in any way we can. We should not make it more difficult for them as the Home Office and social services did for me. Absolutely. And, and another key word in there, compassion. So um, in particular, we're interested to hear about your experiences at school. Um, but can you tell us about a time when you were at school and a teacher or teaching assistant really helped you? And I'm interested to know exactly what they said and what they did that you found helpful at that time. Uh, in terms of school, I think school was something that I had to fight to go to school. I read somewhere, you know, when we wrote The Lightless Sky, there was something, oh, I was sent to a good school. No, I wasn't really sent to a good school. I had to fight for it for over three years to be able to go to a school. And then, yes, I went to a very good school in Bolton. It was very um, diverse and multicultural. Um, 
and I had a, I had a great time. But the first few weeks was difficult. I felt um, alienated. I felt unwelcome, not so much by teachers, but by students and by the way the system worked and because I was new to the system. When, once the teachers understood my circumstances and situation, they were very, very supportive. So I, there was one gentleman who interviewed me for the school at my previous uh, center unit. And he kind of understood my background and story and situation somewhat. So he was there kind of introducing me to my uh, teachers and form teachers and uh, people who are supporting specifically uh, children from disadvantaged background or perhaps unaccompanied minors, asylum seekers. Um, and so there were a, a support mechanism in place. So there was a lady called Mrs. Bolton. She was really wonderful. She just literally was there um, giving me that emotional help and support whenever I was, I know I was feeling down. So it was not so much about academic support, which I needed the most. I didn't want to be treated as a special or someone, you know, unique or whatever. I just wanted to be treated as a normal young person. But I want the teachers or the teacher assistants to understand my struggle somewhat in that I'm not, I'm not just like other kids because of the language barriers and because of the, you know, um, the experiences that I had. And, and so things will be difficult for me and it's going to be harder for me than other students. So, yes, there was a lot of understanding from teachers, from head of years, from, um, from these assistant teachers or people who are specifically supporting. I think they're called pastoral care people who were uh, there just to support us with our kind of well-being and emotional well-being and, and mental health. And so, yes, I got a lot of help. Uh, and um, because I was very active and engaged in school life thereafter, I got to know people. And, uh, and, and that helped. because So I never really had time where I just had to be on my own and be stressed out and have depression and anxiety. I was always doing things. And I was, would always be able to approach people. So being able to approach people, visit people's office and talk to people during breaks and lunch and whenever I needed help, that was very um, useful to me. Okay, that's, that's really helpful to understand. So, and I'm, I'm very interested in the, uh, your comment that actually when people understood you and offered you emotional support, how did you know, what was it that people did that helped you know that they understood I mean, it's little things. So, for example, I remember I used to go to Mrs. Bolson's office and you know, she would make me a cup of tea. Like in school, there's rules around, you know, you're not supposed to be making a cup of tea for students. But I think there are little things that makes a difference. You know, she would make me hot chocolate. Like, and just talk to me and just hear me out. If there's something troubling me, something bothering me. So, sorry, I'm giving you long answers because this is a, a complex um, situation. Uh, and so, yes, and I remember there were things, for example, you know, the school, um, even though it was a very diverse and multicultural school, had a lot of students from migrants' background. Uh, they put me in a German class when I actually needed to learn English. So there were things which didn't go to plan earlier on. But then, you know, as, as they were able to understand my, uh, you know, my story and background and as well as the other, there was other people in my situation as well. And so the teachers, um, once they kind of got to know that I was very uh, hardworking, I was ambitious, I wanted to learn, I was a very good student and uh, I, I make, a, I make uh, an effort, I was dedicated. And so they were a lot of the teachers then became kind of fond of me. They kind of started liking me because I wanted to get on with it. And also the thing, the school given me an opportunity to actually go and study different subjects like geography, religious study, IT. So these subjects were helping me to improve my English as well. And I was always able to go to a head up subject or head up year group saying, look, I want to be given an opportunity to do my GCCs. So the, the, the teachers and people in, in position of authority listened to me. And most of these people believed in me. So that was important to me. They believed in me. And even though, the school didn't think I would get one GCC. I ended up getting 10. But there are people, individuals, individuals in there who say, you know, Gurwali, you, you, you can do this. We'll, we'll, we'll put you forward. We'll give you the chance. You just, you just, you, and then they helped me with one-to-one tuition. They put me forward for extra help. Um, allowed me to actually leave class to do things that I needed to focus on. For example, I used to leave PE, my physical education, which was important. But I used to go and do English instead. And so there were like all these uh, little things that was done for me, which helped me. Uh, to overcome these, you know, challenges and adversities and to achieve and succeed. But yeah, I think understanding, building that relationship and trust, I think that was important because you're, you're kind of a strange, there were over a thousand students. And also it was kind of special to see that these teachers were giving me their time and their attention. I just, I had so many, you know, wonderful opportunities at that place and the school, you know, gave me a chance and I was able to prove them right. And I, I'm really taken by the how just the very small things that have really mattered to you, really small things like actually somebody who made me a drink of tea, somebody who made me a hot chocolate, and the, the importance of listening. Those are those you've conveyed very powerfully. So thank you, thank you so much for that. 
Um, Gulwali, can you tell us about a time when someone was unhelpful, like an adult or a teacher? And I'm asking you this because it's so important that we learn and that we hear how the consequences of our actions and behaviour can sometimes unintentionally actually just be really unhelpful. I, yeah, as I said, I have a very positive experience, but there's one example that I remember. Maybe there were small things that I forgot because I was just like focusing on the positive. But there's one lady who used to work in the, in the office. She was an administrator and we became friends later on, obviously. But uh, at the time, I remember once it was during, um, I think it was work experience or something. Or there, was, there was something that I was able to get permission to leave school, to go to my previous uh, school. And I was able to get permission from uh, one of the directors. So I got to know all the school leadership people. So you know, I was able to get... Uh, permission to go but I met this lady who worked in the reception I said to her could I go and she said no but I still went because I had permission from someone above and the second day I came back to school and she she took me into the office and she was very very mean to me and she said look because I had so many badges and like I was given a lot of stuff and I had a prestigious school and she said to me your Gulwali doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to do. And uh, I could just take away all your badges and I could make your life, you know, life miserable for you. And she was like just going really hard on me. And uh, she was upset that I went against her uh, kind of um, authority and instructions. I did explain that I had permission and everything else, but she was like not listening. I got really, really upset and actually cried. And I went to the, I went to Mrs. Bolton. I cried in her office and she was very understanding. And I got uh, the head teacher involved and I got the West principal involved and, and then actually, you know, this lady had to kind of apologize to me at, at one point because she was just being too dr- uh, drastic and dramatic. It was just the one day I went away. Okay, you know, I shouldn't have maybe, but uh, I didn't really knew all the rules and everything. But I got permission from, from one of the directors. As an Afghan, you know, when, when somebody speaks to you, you look down out of respect. So I was looking down and she was kept telling me to look up to her, to look into her eyes. And um, she wouldn't understand that I was doing this out of respect and out of shame. And I felt embarrassed that. I sh- you know, this shouldn't have been happening. I thought I've done something really big when I haven't. It was something very small and, you know, uh, permission was already given to me. She said to me, don't go. I still went. She could have done it in a, in a more humane, in a, in a nice way. But then I was able to go to people who were able to comfort me and kind of give me a word of um, caution and advice and support. As, as I said, I don't want them to treat asylum seekers and refugees in any special way, but I want them to understand that our experiences and our circumstances, our situations are very different to the ordinary students. And sometimes they need to show, um, you know, um, uh, what is the word um, I'm looking for? Discretion. So yeah, ultimately it's good to maybe hear the persons out. Uh, thank you for telling us that story. And actually you've answered my next question because my next question was going to be, you know, what should this person have done instead? And actually you've already told us, actually they could have asked the question. They could have listened. Um, and there was, a, there was an issue about communication there as well, wasn't there? Which is why Indeed. actually... Uh, when people did all understand what was happening, the response was different. Um, but I've heard a key message there about the importance of discretion and communication and more understanding about the very particular needs of children who are refugees. Gowali, we've got, we have lots and lots of staff who work with us. And this is a, uh, this is a chance that I'd really like to give you to um, share with all of those people that are going to be listening to this. What do you wish um, that the teachers and teaching assistants at your school had heard from somebody like you before you arrived? I feel like, as I said, my teachers were very, very nice and, and caring and concerned people, but I feel like they had very little understanding what it means to be a refugee, what it means to be an asylum seeker, and migrant, even though they had a lot of people in their schools from these backgrounds. Uh, and when I was able to actually share my story, I went and did assemblies with my broken English because I was, it was important to me. I was kind of upset and a little bit angry as well to see the children not respecting teachers, not you know, taking education for granted. So I wanted to get the record straight to say, look, I went to school with, with very little facilities, and, but still wanted to learn and respect our teachers and treat them with utmost you know, dignity and respect. When you're in that situation, you are in a legal limbo. You have so many things going, out, going on outside school. School is the only positive thing in your lives. And if people are making it difficult for you, either students or teachers, then it's, your whole life is a, kind of a, a misery. So you need the teachers to be, you know, to be understanding and to be supportive as we were saying, compassionate, ensuring solidarity. I mean, I remember when I was doing my refugee status application, I had most of my teachers write me letters of support. So I think in some schools, they may not be allowed. I don't know because there's all sorts of rules around things, but my, most of my head up subjects and head up year groups and, uh, and a lot of people in school actually wrote me letters of support. Uh, that was very, you know, touching and, and they, they went that extra mile. And I remember like most of these teachers would 
um, would have extra revision classes for me and for us and the people in similar situations. And the teachers were pleased that we wanted to learn and we wanted to engage. So I would say to teachers and, and teachers assistants and people who work with refugees and unaccompanied minors and migrants and asylum seekers is to give them time. We, I had to catch up and work like in two years for the whole school, uh, prim since primary school or whatever, since, since year, eight, year seven till uh, five years or whatever years that I had to catch up on. And it just needs, you need a lot of um, time, but you need encouragement, you need positive words. Because if you have a student in your class who, who have, for whatever reason, is struggling, um, you could hopefully know that, you know, because of their, their background, because of their experiences, they're, they're struggling. So you could be more uh, mindful of that. Because I have been to classes where students were treated really badly because they thought, they thought that they were just normal students when in fact they weren't. They had a baggage, uh, 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 um, anxiety, depressions, and emotional issues and problems at home. And so these, these children have so many challenges. So please, you know, showing them uh, empathy. Uh, not in a, like in a way that they victims, but in a, in a positive way. So that will definitely help. So in my experience, I was was positive because there was a communication between me and the teachers. There was a two way two way process. That's that's so helpful. And you've you've talked about lots of really key things there, like empathy and listening and understanding. And actually, I'm really conscious that there's there's so much more that we need to learn about the experience of children that arrive in our schools um, in traumatic circumstances. Gowali, can you tell us about your book? Yeah, so The Lightless Sky um, was written in 2015. Since then, it's published in uh, seven countries in six languages. I never thought one day I'd write a book. Okay, so the book is about my story, my experiences of leaving Afghanistan, my childhood, what happened and the journey, why I left the conflict war uh, and how I managed to get to the UK and this journey. Why, why did I come here? And then what happened uh, being in the UK? And of course, there's a lot in there about schooling, about what helped, what didn't help, uh, my education and going through college and university. Uh, and education has been the most important thing to me. And for most refugees, you know, education is really uh, crucial. They want, to, um, they want to get education. They want to achieve and be successful. Uh, they have hopes and dreams and aspirations. So, yeah, and I encourage everyone to read it to better understand our experiences, struggles and stories and journeys. So for them to help and support us in a, in a more inclusive and, uh, and, and helpful way. That's, that's great. Thank you. And we will be encouraging people to read it as well, Gowali. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, just last of all, Gowali, can you tell us about Olive Branch Fostering? Brilliant. So Olive Branch Fostering, I got involved with him moment five, six years ago, before the book, actually, maybe. Um, I knew this gentleman who wanted to set up this agency. And because my own experiences of being fostered um, uh, for two years whilst I was at school in my sixth form college, and because of being a, a, a from a refugee background, he was very keen to have somebody uh, on the panel, uh, not only just the, the experiences of being fostered in a care lever, but also someone from a, a migrant background. Because we, you know, the, in, not, in the Northwest, there's a lot of referrals to, uh, for unaccompanied minors to be housed uh, with, with foster families. So yeah, that agency is based near Manchester and we, we have a very diverse group of foster carers as well as children. And I have been involved with them as a panel member for the last five, six years. And it's been a great experience seeing people why they want to foster and how they want to have an impact and make a difference. It's really wonderful. So, I, you know, when people ask me what they could do, because it's uh, overwhelming, it's, you know, we sometimes feel powerless and helpless and hopeless because the number of people displaced, there are 80 million displaced people, half of them are children, 30 million refugees. If you have a room, if you have a place in your heart, uh, foster a refugee child, you know, write to your MP, go on demonstrations, um, help them with English classes, help them with the language, uh, be, do befriending, mentoring, um, uh, you know, buddying, all these little things um, helps, help them with their asylum applications, go with them for a coffee, show them around your area, help them with how to access healthcare and so on. All these little things that we could do. And again, in my school, I was able to get a lot of help through the school nurse and through these uh, teacher assistants and these people for outside things. I was able to be, you know, a signposted to like the youth services, youth participation work. I got involved with the, the local youth council, uh, the UK Youth Parliament, other charities and other groups through kind of school. And so school could play a very crucial in, in, um, in, a, in a positive role in your, uh, not only in your education, but your outside kind of activities and help you introduce you to the right people. Gowali, that's, that's so inspiring. Thank you so Thank much you, uh, for your time with us today. Thanks um, for having me. I just, can I just say I have huge you know, admiration and respect for teachers. Teachers are, you know, we wouldn't have doctors and scientists or whatever, engineers without teachers. So teachers are very special people. I hope we could you know, pay them well. I hope we could look after them better. But I just feel like teachers could do so much more if you give them the freedom 
um, to go out there and to educate kids and to give them that awareness about these, these social justice and these issues, which, which matters, which are important. So yeah, I think, I thank all you, uh, you know, teachers for doing the work they do and helping people like me be able to communicate. Thank you so much. It's been a brilliant talk with you today and moved and inspired. So thank you so much, thank Paul Ali. It's lovely to talk with you today. 10 with Zen is brought to you by Zen Educate. Zen Educate's online platform puts you in control of supply and recruitment, and they've saved UK schools over £3 million by allowing them to connect with teachers and TAs directly. To receive 50% off your first day booked with Zen, just DM us on Twitter at Zen Educate and quote 10 with Zen. Thanks for listening.